You're listening to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast, episode 23, released in early April 2020. In today's episode, we'll protect your hardbacks with dust covers with the right kind of bag in our collection protection. Our outrageous offer will make you jump out of your chair and say, what the is that all about? Also, we'll take our main story to the first two years of the Alan Wingate Publishing House, who happened to publish only two books for the entire year, and thankfully for us, they're Doctor Who. And whenever we do that, we rely upon our resident expert and host of the Target Book Club podcast, Tony Witt, will be joining the discussion. And now, Q Frazier. say who. Welcome back to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast, the podcast that explores the world of Doctor Who collecting, Doctor Who collectors, protection of your collectibles, and of course, Doctor Who merchandise. Anything with a Doctor Who related item is free to talk about. I am Larry Van Mersbergen, your host, and I have been a Doctor Who collector since 1981 and opened one of the first Doctor Who only stores in Chicago in 1984 called Bundles from Britain. Our theme song is Who's Doctor Who by Barry Mason and Les Reed, performed by Fraser Hines, who played Jamie McCrimmon in over 113 Doctor Who episodes. We thank you for listening. We ask you to consider supporting us. And during these difficult times, of course, trying to keep our social distancing and keeping ourselves healthy, um, producing this podcast helps people stay at home and listen to their favorite topics on Doctor Who. So please consider supporting us. You can do it a number of ways. The first way is on our Patreon page at patreon.com backslash Doctor Who Collectors Podcast. Uh, You can also do it the fun way. You can shop for your favorite Doctor Who items on Amazon by visiting first at DoctorWhoCollectors.com and clicking on the Amazon link to the place you want to purchase, and we get a portion of that proceed. Your price stays the same, but Amazon shares a little bit of that money with us. You can also lastly support us on Podbean. That's Podbean. It's Doctor Who Collectors. Podbean. Com, and you can support us and patronize us on Podbean as well. Uh, you can also hear this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, and anywhere podcasts are found. We're a proud member of the Doctor Who Podcast Alliance. You can hear great Doctor Who podcasts at Doctor Who Podcast Alliance. Dot com, dot org, excuse me. Uh, during this difficult time, please stay safe. Um, at this time, you know, we usually do a plug for Chicago TARDIS, uh, which will be in November. And as of today, it is still on. Um, of course, that could change. We don't know if the travel ban from Europe will be lifted, which is where most of the guests come from. And uh, as of today, the only confirmed guest uh, mentioning here is Michael Troughton, the son of the second doctor, Patrick Troughton. So, uh, and of course, that's all contingent upon what happens in our world today. Sad, Red, isn't it? People spend all that time making nice things and other people come along and break them. It's time for collection protection. We don't want people breaking things. Your special hardcover books, especially the ones with dust jackets, which uh, were produced by W by Alan Wingate, excuse me, almost exclusively up until uh, the late seventies or so, and you need protection for those. There is a specifically designed bag produced by Bags Unlimited Incorporated. Bags Unlimited has been doing collection protection now since the early 1980s, and I started using them in 1981. I used them as a dealer in 1984, and I use them today to protect my Doctor Who collectibles. The bag that they make um, is a uh, bag with the item code SPJ, which is a 2.5 mil, 6 and 1 8 by 10 inch protective sleeve. The bag fits perfectly over the Doctor Who hardcover, and not too snug. 
but it will protect the dust jacket as well. It will not crinkle or, you know, just be careful entering it. There's no flap, but enough bag left over to pull it over and tape closed. These bags are made for long-term archival protection. It protects the pages from yellowing, protects the cover from getting brittle, and also makes it easier to label your your um, your book without damaging the book. I usually have a label on the back that identifies, you know, the title, the year published, what printing it is, if it's autographed by somebody. That way I know at a glance what's going on with that book. You can go to bagsunlimited.com. They are not a sponsor of the podcast, just my personal preference and the place I go to for all my collection protection needs. Bagsunlimited.com. And if you order from them, please let them know that you heard it on the Doctor Who Collectors podcast. And of course, if you want to share any other collection protection ideas, stories, or products, please write to us. Best place to reach us is on Facebook or Twitter at Doctor Who Collectors Podcast, or you can use the old-fashioned email at Doctor Who Collectors Podcast at gmail.com. And don't forget the website, DoctorWhoCollectors.com. You can contact us through the form there as well. More after the break. Hello fellow time travelers, I'm Tony Witt with the Doctor Who Target Book Club podcast, the podcast in which we undertake the insert adjective here task of discussing in story order all of the Doctor Who novelizations. I'm joined by... Dalton Hughes. And by... Alison Fitzsafry. And we record our episodes twice a month. You're listening to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast. Enjoy your travels! Up there is the scanner, those are the doors, that is a chair with a panda on it. Sheer poetry, dear boy. And now the main story. For some reason, the Doctor Who hardcovers are a really uh, attractive uh, thing for collectors because they weren't very many published in the early years of uh, Doctor Who. And what's really interesting, we're going to talk a little bit about the Alan Wingate Publishing Company. Now, Alan Wingate... Uh, basically started publishing books in the middle part of the 1800s, and mostly it's interesting because they say they're for the colonies, Um, and even though we were the United States back then. But they had a long gap between 1959 and 1974, and what was really interesting, in 1974, they only published two books, and both of those books are two of the books we're going to talk about tonight in Doctor Who. And so I want to make clear, though, that there's a difference between Alan Wingate and W.H. Allen. You're both familiar with those publishers. They're not the same company. Uh, Allen Wingate, spelled A-L-L-A-N, is one publisher, and W.H. Allen, A-L-L-E-N, is a completely different publisher. And so later on in 1977, um, for some reason, between November and December, uh, Allen Wingate gives up the publishing rights uh, and moves on to, it moves over to W.H. Allen, which owns the Target imprint. So whenever we talk about Doctor Who novels on the Doctor Who Collectors podcast, I like to bring in a resident expert, so to speak, the host and producer of the Doctor Who Target Book Club podcast and a dear friend, Mr. Tony Witt. Tony, welcome to the podcast again. Hello, fellow time travelers. I'm oops, sorry. <laughs> I wouldn't do that for some reason. That's okay. Yeah. That's, I'm uh, not used to not running the podcast, but it's very good to be here. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I will admit when I was on your podcast, I'm whistling, who, who is Dr. Who? <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. The, the, the fun part about that is that at Chicago TARDIS, I actually walked past somebody who was playing that song on their phone, and I looked over and they were actually listening to one of my podcasts. So I thought, oh, this oh, is awesome. So <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> so, um, yes, and uh, of course, uh, I've, I've appeared on the Target Book Club podcast twice. I was a panelist for The Mind of Evil and for Day of the Daleks. And uh, if you tune into those episodes, you'll even see how many up ep- Versions of Day of the Daleks I brought to the um, to the table, and um, and just uh, just to let everybody know, we are practicing uh, safe social distancing as we're keeping a fifty mile radius between the two of us. Um, <laughs> as uh, Tony is in Chicago and I'm in the west suburbs of Aurora, so we should be okay. Um, and uh, so we'll 
Back to uh, back to the first book here. I'm going to talk about Doctor Who and the Auton Invasion, which was published in January of 1974, uh, alongside the Target book version, which was published under the W.H. Allen imprint for Target. And it's a very um, it's a very interesting book. It's actually considered one of the most sought after books by collectors. Uh, the highest price I've seen for one of these is about two thousand dollars. And Which is insane. I, it, it absolutely is, and I and I remember the the buyer on eBay specifically, and I even uh, messaged him and I said I don't think you're going to get that, and he kind of got a little angry with me as sometimes <laughs> collectors do out there. I've, I've actually been banned from a few Facebook pages for putting my opinion out there, and then finding out later, yeah, I guess I was right, but that's okay. Um, you know, when you <laughs> when you talk to a former dealer <laughs> as well as a collector you know i remember what this stuff sold for and it's kind of you know that's not how uh <laughs> it's not gonna sell for do that no one's gonna shell out that kind of money um yeah. but um you know and we had and we had uh, a couple podcasts ago we had a really in-depth discussion of the vinyl recordings that big finish does for sainsbury uh market in england and how they get pushed over here at nine times the price oh. And I remember I actually wrote an email to the Big Finish podcast and Nick Briggs was wonderful to read it um, and address that, which was nice. I played I replayed his comments on, I think, two podcasts ago, if you go back, where he said that they're working on some way of doing it for the United States, but they are absolutely um, against the policy of people going into the store five times, buying five copies and selling them for two hundred dollars a piece to the U to the U.S. market. And they've brought it up at the at the highest uh, level. So that's Jason A. Hillary. Uh, and they're going to work on that, of course, once this uh, whole virus thing uh, hopefully plays its course. But back to the Auton Invasion. One of the things that's interesting about um, the book, of course, these books have dust covers. And this one features the original artwork of Chris Achilleos, uh, Doctor Who and the Autumn Invasion, Terrence Dix, based on the popular BBC television series. The wonderful, I think it's one of the best pictures of John Pertwee, the Brigadier, and an Auton. Uh, actually, a better Auton than what appeared in the TV series, if you're right, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> or the tentacles that came out of the tank. And I'm sure John Perry was like, really? <laughs> That's, um, yeah. And uh, on the inside flap, uh, we have two quotes here. One from the Daily Mirror, which says, This Doctor Who adventure, televised as Spearhead from Space, wins my vote as the best in the lifetime of the series so far. And to, from the Daily Sketch, Doctor Who, the children's old program which adults adore. <laughs> Yeah, I wondered where that quote came from because we've heard it before, but we didn't know where exactly it originated. Yeah, I'm not sure how many. Um, we'll probably see how, when we when we go to the second year um, of the books. We'll see how far it goes. Um, but I, I've noticed it's not in the cave monsters, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, but it's all, it's all here. The inside back flap is, of course, a wonderfully young photo of the late Terrence Dix. A little bit of a, a biography here, and the only other book that he had written on Doctor Who at the time was The Making of Doctor Who, published on the Piccolo imprint, which features John Pertwee on the cover. That book was later revised and rewritten for the Target book line. And um, is that a Target book you're going to cover on your podcast at some point, Tony? Which one again? The, the Making of Doctor Who. Uh, probably not. I mean, okay. we, we could, I think we've already passed the point at which it was published and we've passed the point with the, uh, the stories that it was actually covering. So it may be, uh, well, behind us now, unfortunately. Maybe. Yeah, that's true. That, that could be a bonus track for her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for probably the, for that might be something to give our Patreon. So yeah, you'll absolutely. get to hear it, but probably no one else will. <laughs> that's true. And I always enjoy the, by the way, if you're not, uh, subscribing to either of these podcasts, get to the Patreon pages and you can get an early glimpse and some bonus tracks that are not usually included with the free distribution. Um, the other thing about the uh, Auton Invasion is that this particular hardcover includes all the wonderful illustrations that were included in the paperback edition. I'm looking at page 42, where it says the doctor whizzed at tremendous speed down the short, steep hill, and it shows a picture of John Pertwee with the line showing he's moving in the wheel, spinning really fast in his, in his pajamas, <laughs> slippers, and uh, his mouth taped. And uh, that's uh, I actually thought that was one of the best scenes in the TV series, actually, when he gets away on the, and he 
rides down the hill and just seems to know exactly where the TARDIS is. <laughs> so right. I'm like, oh, that's convenient. Oh, look at that. So it's got all of that. Um, and just going through the the print is really easy to read. Uh, it's very the type is very nice and it's on an opaque paper here. So it's very, very easy to read and well published. The end of the book, they actually have an ad here for Doctor Who and the Cave Monsters, which is the only other book they published that year. And a few uh, throwback books and books that they actually have some of the books they published in 1959, like the story of the Loch Ness Monster, the creepy crawly book. I'm sure was a, it says it's for older boys and girls. So that's, you know, not sure about that, but, uh, and then the adventures of Rama, a noble and Indian prince. So there we go. Oh dear. Uh, so that's, that's, that's <laughs> I'm sure that's going to be culturally sensitive. Uh, yeah, in fact, I'm not going to, I just glanced over the text and I'm not going to read that here. Uh, so you'll have to, <laughs> you'll have to find an eBay seller willing to negotiate with you to get a copy of this book. Uh, as far as what it's worth, um, if you find a copy in mint condition, which will be rare because Alan Wingate published most of its books strictly for libraries, and in this case, UK libraries, the hardcover editions of Doctor Who did not get into the United States until 1984. Oh my. And I'll, I'll mention a little bit about that later on. So there were, you know, from 1974 to 1984, a whole 10 years of publications were not available in the United States except through... Uh, a few people who were able to get them over here, and there weren't very many in the retail market. But again, it's a it's a wonderful book. I'm glad to have it, uh, at least one copy to, to to share with you today. And now uh, we'll look at the Doctor Who and the Cave Monsters, which came out the same day, the same month. Uh, same thing with the paperback in January of 1974. Um, it features a green cover, green type, and a green. Um, dust cover. And like the Auton Invasion, the cloth bound hardcover underneath is a blue cloth with gold stamp on the on the end. Uh, in this case, Doctor Who and the Cave Monsters, Malcolm Hulk with the Wingate logo stamped at the bottom. The Wingate logo does not appear on either book's dust jacket, which is Ooh. interesting. And the price of both books is one pound 75 net, which in today's pounds is a little over 10 pounds. Or about yeah, so 18... way, way too expensive for the uh, average school kid back then. Oh, absolutely. That was a lot of money back in the day. And so if, if the bookstores carried it, they carried very few, and they probably didn't sell very well. Um, mm -hmm. Sales figures were impossible to, to locate as Alan Wingate is no longer in business. So uh, And nobody published those figures. So it's an interesting uh, thing. Now, what's also interesting about this book, we talked about the Auton Invasion having wonderful illustrations. The Cave Monsters has only one illustration, and that's at the very front of the book, the, uh, the map of the countryside, if you yes. remember that. The, the horizontal section of Winley Moor, that's the only one. And in the middle of the book is a letter. Oh, I just saw another illustration here. So there's two illustrations as I flip through here. Some good stuff. Um, there is a letter here from the chief constable, and it includes his signature right across the bottom on page 68. So they printed mm -hmm. that into the book as well. Um, they also put that in the, uh, in the paperback, as yes. it turns out. Oh, that's great. Oh, wonderful. Yes, yes. So it looks like they used the exact same imprint for both Target and Alan Wingate, which, again, two different companies. So... Interesting, they must have had an agreement of some kind or they got permission. Um, but again, the copyright doesn't refer to W.H. Allen at all. It just says copyright Allen Wingate and Universal Tandem Publishing. Now, there is a possibility that Universal Tandem Publishing might have had W.H. Allen under its umbrella, but that I could not find that information. So if anybody out there knows, you can write to us. Our email is DrWhoCollectorsPodcast at gmail.com or Facebook and Twitter at Dr. Who Collectors Podcast. All right. So in the back, um, basically, the, those are the two books. Now, what's also interesting about these two is they're the only two hardcovers to use the John Pertwee block logo for Dr. Who. Hmm. And uh, those are the only two hardcovers to come out in 1974. So that was uh, that's why these two books are considered 
very rare. Now, the Cave Monsters is actually less rare. I've seen numerous editions of the Cave Monsters, including mint copies and ex-library copies, ranging anywhere from $400 below, done down. So it's a little more reasonable to get a hold of a, a Cave Monsters. There must be more of them out there. Uh, the one I have is an ex-library edition, but it's really in good shape. Uh, it didn't have the, uh, the pocket glued into it. And uh, those of you who are millennials, let me explain. In the old days, when you checked out a book, they took a little slip of paper out of a pocket. You wrote your name on it. You gave that to the librarian. Tony, you remember that, right? Yeah, and they still do that at Roosevelt University, too. Oh, they do? Okay. They really do. It's surprising. Oh, that is surprising, because that is just a... And, of course, some of the books that I've seen ex-library, somebody has attempted to rip the pocket out. And, oh. you know... I'll, I'll encourage collectors, if you get an ex-library copy with a pocket, leave the pocket in there. You'll do less damage to the book. Uh, and the same thing with, you know, stickers that are maybe on the cover. I would say just let them be. They, you'll do more damage trying to remove them. And, and I wouldn't trust any of those chemicals because it'll probably wreck your cover in some way. And, you know, you want to spend $400 on a book only to have your, you know, your ink run from a chemical you thought was safe to use on it. Um, so be very careful with those. And uh, as I talked about before the break, get a hold of those bo those uh, bags that I talked about, the SPJ bags from Bags Unlimited Incorporated. They fit the hardcovers perfectly. So great to do that. Now let's move forward to 1975. And like 1974, whoever was in charge at Allen Wingate decided, well, let's, you know, we did two great books last year and Obviously, that must have fed the company for a whole year because they did two more the following year. <laughs> and they decided to publish The Planet of the Spiders and The Three Doctors in that order. So they did the last John Pertwee episode and then the 10th anniversary. And I'll start with Planet of the Spiders. This one is, um, this book is very special to me because, uh, like I mentioned before, when Doctor Who hardcovers were first made available in the United States, and I know I may have mentioned this before, but they were available first in Chicago mm -hmm. at Bundles from Britain, the company that I started back in 1984. We had 30 copies of Doctor Who and the Planet of the Spiders second edition with the dust jacket. Oh, and wow. we charged $20 a book and we sold out of them at TARDIS 22. Good so. Grief. I know, and that's, uh, gosh, that was 1985, so that was a long time ago, but uh, nobody had seen them. We were the only dealer with hardcovers, so that, that, made, the, uh, that made the stage. That started the, uh, the whole thing. Now, The Planet of the Spiders has uh, one thing that's different right off the bat is they move to the late Pertwee, early Tom Baker Doctor Who logo with the curved uh, Doctor and Who, the way we've seen it from that time period and the Planet of the right. Spiders. The wonderful cover by Chris Achilleos showing the spider on the back of Sarah Jane and the gradual regeneration to Tom Baker at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And unlike the previous season, on the back cover, they have a little coming shortly. If you've enjoyed reading this Doctor Who story, look out for Doctor Who the Three Doctors, <laughs> and, which is the other book they published that year. And also... Doctor Who Meets the Loch Ness Monster. It says Meets the Loch Ness Monster by Terrence Dix. <laughs> At last, the encounter of the fourth Doctor with the dreaded monster. Will Doctor Who be able to unravel the legend of, Noc ne of Loch Ness? That book was scheduled to be published August of 1976. So it was another year and some before that one even came out. So that was, they were thinking, right. they were actually thinking ahead. <laughs> right. The inside, um, the inside flap has a little bit of a, a spoiler here, of our, a little uh, like what would probably have been on the back of the Target book. Uh, it's happening, Brigadier. It's happening. That, that whole um, that, that summary that usually goes on the back of the Target book, I think. Mm -hmm. And then at the bottom, it says Doctor Who awarded the 1974 Writers Guild Award for Best British Children's Original Drama Script. So that was interesting. And there was a little bit of a price increase here. This was £2.25 net for this book. Oh, my. And this is a smaller book than the previous books. This book is slightly smaller in size. Um, it is a blue cloth with the same gold imprint on the side. 
This time, though, the Wingate logo appears on the dust jacket. So they decided to use a white cover on the dust jacket so they could print text on the back. The inside back flap has a different photo of Terrence Dix and a little bit of a less... Um, they, they kind of shortened his uh, biography from the Autun invasion. So that was a real interesting uh, difference there. And they don't actually talk about his other Doctor Who books. It just says that he is now a freelance author and writes many of the highly successful Doctor Who books. And is currently it's launching... Almost all of them. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. He was like the, the guy that did almost all of them. Um, and so uh, I know this is a book you have not yet covered in the um, yes. podcast. But uh, what are your... Th- if, you've, if you've read it or know anything about it, what are your thoughts on it? I don't have a very good memory of it. I okay. think that may be one of the few novelizations that I didn't read as a child and never really got around to reading once I got it as an adult. Okay. And that's partially because I, mm, I, I know I'm going, to, I'm going to get threats on my life because of this, but I've never been terribly impressed with Planet of the Spiders as a story. Yeah, yeah. And that may be the issue <laughs> that kept me from reading the book. Now, when we do get to the book, I'll, of course, give it, uh, from Reed, since it is apparently an earlier Terrence Dix book, and yes, yes. his earlier stuff tends to be better. That's true. So that that'll be interesting. And and I know I've mentioned this before to to my listeners that when you when you do the Target books in story order, you get different, not only different uh, authors' um, takes on it, but the same author in different decades writing one book after another. In a story, if you're going in story order, you'll have a book from 74 followed by a book that was released in 86. So that's exactly. so there's a lot of difference. And by the way, if you want to get into the in depth um, discussion of these books, I highly recommend the Doctor Who Target Book Club podcast. And um, the next one, I believe, is The Planet of the Spiders. Uh, so right now, The Space War is out. So it, and uh, I enjoyed it thoroughly. I finished it today on my commute, it was wonderful. Um, Actually, it's going to be doing uh, Green Death. Oh, fantastic. Oh, The Green Death. Okay, fantastic. Yep, that's our next one. So we're doing another Hulk book very quickly. Oh, very good. Very good. So that's the Planet of the Spiders. What is Planet of the Spiders worth? Now, the copy I have, I have both a first edition. I have a first edition that's an ex-library edition and a second edition that I got in 1984. As owner of the company, I was allowed to take one book. (laughs) And, uh, and 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 so did Mr. Gene Smith. He took one as well. And um, we still have those books. I, I cherish it because it's in mint condition. It is in new condition. When you open it, it crackles like a new book. And um, it's the same cover. It just says second in printing. They did two printings of this book in the same year. And um, they again used the Baskerville type. And uh, the copyright date moves to 1975. Now, the last book we're going to talk about is the second book published in 1975. The Three Doctors was published in November, as the same as The Planet of the Spiders. And it's interesting that they were the only two books published in 75 as well. Now, um, moving forward, Ellen Wingate decided, well, you know, this Doctor Who thing might not be a bad thing. So they did nine titles in 1976 in hardback. So... <laughs> <laughs> The Three Doctors. So, in the inside, the front cover, of course, is one of my favorite covers um, of all time. It shows Omega with his hand stretched out over the Three Doctors. And the, the drawings of these Doctors, I think, are some of the best drawings I've ever seen. And the Doctors are in black and white, and Omega is in full color. So, mm-hmm. it's, it's just a beautiful cover. I, I was not fond of the Target reprint cover that had the three floating heads in space. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Not as, not as impressive as this uh, gloss on Jack Kirby and uh, Fantastic Four comics. Right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, the the back cover of the uh, Three Doctors, of course, also available in the Doctor Who series, Planet of the Spiders, because it was the only other book published that year. And they also have, coming shortly, Doctor Who meets the Loch Ness Monster. Now... Of course, I don't own a copy of the hardcover of the Loch Ness Monster, so I'm curious to know, does it actually say Doctor Who meets the Loch Ness Monster or Doctor Who and the Loch Ness Monster? I guess I'll have to, I'll have to get a copy and I'll let you know. Um, the inside uh, of the book, they have the same kind of thing on the inside front cover. Again, the £2.25 
uh, price increase from the previous year, which is actually quite a hefty price increase, thinking about uh, from 175 to 225. I thought they would, might, might have gone two pounds, but they decided to add the extra 25 in there. Uh, they do give uh, another very brief uh, by, you know, summary of the story here, probably the same thing that's on the back of the Target and the Doctor Who awarded the 74 Writers Guild Award. Um, and at the end of the book, they're still promoting... Um, actually, no, I take that back. Planet of the Spiders was the last book where they promoted other books in the back. This one does not have it. And this book is completely, along with Planet of the Spiders, no illustrations. Mm. So the illustrations were taken out completely. And... Three Doctors. Uh, this book is actually in very good condition. It is an ex-library, but the dust jacket is in near mint condition. Um, you can find copies of The Three Doctors in various conditions. I would not pay more than $250 for a copy in mint condition, and probably you can get around $75 to $100 for a copy in very good condition or ex-library. And once again, if I explain to my listeners, ex-library means that it was pulled from a library and probably had the plastic cover taken off, which probably was what kept the dust jacket in good shape because they put that cellophane wrapper over it. Um, and a, a non-library copy is a copy that was sold to a retail store and doesn't have any library markings in it. Um, now, this is the podcast I remember that was done from Chicago TARDIS. And what, yep. was, what was your thoughts on The Three Doctors? Well, I don't remember what my score was for it because I didn't manage to review that part of the episode in time. But Allison gave it a 2.5, which is standard for her, and Dalton gave it a 3.5. I got the impression that they actually quite liked that book. They mm. definitely said that it wasn't as good for them as Autumn Invasion had them, for obvious reasons, because it's a later Terrence Dix book. But they did actually enjoy it. So I definitely think it was one of the highlights of uh, the podcast so far. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, and I, I, I was there for a short while, and I, I remember uh, witnessing you know, some of the discussion, and it was very, very riveting. And, of course, um, if you go to Chicago TARDIS, which I always promote at the front side of the podcast— um, you you know you, they've got many things going on. There's the the live podcast. There's a meet and greet. There's an autograph session, and you're gonna be late for your photo if that line is too long. And it's a lot of fun. So if um, if all goes well, there's gonna be another Chicago TARDIS this year at the Westin in Lombard. So we hope to see you there. Um, one more thing I'll add is that this this particular hardcover this is the first one that has the words, and I love this this little saying. This book is sold subject to the condition that it shall not. <laughs> Which means we should make up our mind, shouldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> it shall not, by way of trade, be lent, resold, hired out, or otherwise disposed of without the publisher's consent. So that means I can't throw it away without getting in writing from Ellen Wingate, London. <laughs> yes, you may toss this book. <laughs> I've never understood what that meant, but <laughs> it's a bit like that tag that you get on mattresses. Yes, yeah, do mattresses not remove this tag. Get uh, get you. <laughs> right under penalty, federal penalty of whatever, and that's uh, it's it's also uh, also has the uh, the first time it it says the changing face of Doctor Who. The color of his illustration portrays the first, second, and third Doctors. So this was the fourth hardcover edition. Um, they did two of these in 1975. Now, not to be left out, um, there was another company that produced a few hardcovers, and I'm going to talk about that in a future podcast, and that is the White Lion publisher. Um, mm -hmm. White Lion did the Daleks, the Crusaders, and the Zarbi, which, interesting enough, are the three books that were published by Frederick Mueller back in 1964, and 1965, and 1966. So... Um, apparently, those were the rights that triggered the whole Target book thing. When they got the rights to those books, they said, hey, I think this is going to take off. And uh, you even mentioned, I know in the, in the last one I listened to, that because of the Target books, it kept the show on the air. Yes. And yeah. as a matter of fact, that's something that came up in the uh, Blu-ray edition that has just come out of the, that particular season of John Pertwee, that had it not been for the Target imprint, Probably they would have canceled Doctor Who after the 10th season because at that point there were no shows really that 
lasted longer than 10 seasons on the BBC. And as soon as they got the request to do the target imprints, they said, well, let's see if it, sh- if it, um, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Let's see if it affects the viewing figures, mm-hmm. and we'll see if we can continue the show uh, so that we have more stories for them to novelize. And sure enough, it definitely caused the viewing figures to bump a little bit, and the sales figures were wonderful. So that's why they continue to have a symbiotic relationship well into the uh, early 90s, even after the show is off the air. And that actually makes a lot of sense looking at these publishing figures. They did two books in 74, two books in 75, nine books in 76, um, because that would be the 11th year. Um, mm-hmm. 77, real quick, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 19 books in 77. <laughs> So, obviously, they, they, they went on a publishing spree, um, and those were all Alan Wingate books up until the last um, month of 77, when The Mask of Mandragora and The Seeds of Doom came out. They were published by W.H. Allen. Mm-hmm. And real quick, W.H. Allen and Company, they were established in 1835, and they were known for issuing books that were mostly shipped to the United States, or as they referred to as the British Colonies. <laughs> um, it operated from headquarters in Leadenhall Street, later moving to Waterloo Place. The owners and staff include James P. Allen, William Fernley Allen, and William Houghton Allen. That's where the WH comes from. Um, it is now owned by Ebury Press, which is a division of Penguin Random House, which is, again, two more publishing houses that apparently got together and bought other publishing houses, because Penguin Books and Random House were two different book companies back in the day, too. So it's an interesting uh, history. The hardcover editions lasted all the way until 1988. The last one was The Smugglers. um, And it was a different, you know, that was the last WH Allen hardback. They said declining sales uh, were the most reason why they just went to the paperbacks. And again, the United States market uh, didn't pick up until 1984. And what's interesting is that we were told, and I'll tell the story again, that um, when we uh, had placed our order for Target Books uh, from Lyle Stewart, which was the distributor in uh, New York, the guy on the phone said, hey, would you guys like the hardcover editions? And I'll never forget this because Gene put the hand over the phone and said, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so he's like, well, how many do you want? And we're like, how many do you have? Tell you what, I'll send you everything we've got. So wow. they couldn't give them away. <laughs> if you can believe that, Tony, they could not give away these hardcover editions. No bookstore wanted them. No one thought they would sell. And, you know, wow. this is this is 84. Doctor Who was starting to be a big thing. There were conventions in 83. There was a lot of stuff going on. The, the show had just hit the uh, 20th anniversary. And um, so a few, about a week later, I get a phone call and Gene's like, come on over now. There's 19 boxes in his apartment. <laughs> uh, and only one of them was our was our target order. <laughs> so. Oh, wow. <laughs> and. Um, and, and this is the first time I'm actually telling the final part of this story because, uh, you know, um, to be to be honest, Gene's a great guy. He runs the Chicago TARDIS. He's the head of Alien Entertainment. But um, he never wanted this to be known. But it's 20 years later, so nobody cares. We never got an invoice for those hardcovers. Oh, my. <laughs> and when we when we called to follow it up, they never heard of the guy we talked to. Wow. So we were like, OK. <laughs> <laughs> so we got uh we had um every title i can i can remember almost every title we had second printings of uh, planet of the spiders we had um everything that came out in 19, you know that androids of tara stones of blood invasion of time armageddon factor monster of peladon creature from the pit doomsday weapon warrior's gate and a couple of the perk we uh the not the part we uh the davison ones castro valva form of doomsday terminus uh copies of the dalek omnibus the arc of infinity um, and we sold all of those at TARDIS 22, and we were the only dealer in the room to have these books. So um, that that you know that was probably one of the best stories of of, of early dealer um, stuff that happened. And um, of course, these books 
you know, you can find these books. Um, just do a search on eBay or Abe's Used Books online and just be very careful. Before you pay a couple hundred dollars, make sure you get a full photo of what you're buying and you make sure you're actually examining what you're getting. So let the buyer beware, of course. Um, a special thank you to my good friend Tony Witt, who joined me on the program today, providing uh, some great in-depth information on these stories. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. And the podcast is the Doctor Who Target Book Club podcast featuring Tony Witt. Allison Fitzsafery and Dalton Hughes. Thought I'd give Allison top bidding on that one. So here we go. Thank you so much for joining us. This is the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast. Money? My dear chef, I don't want money. I've got no use for the stuff. And now it's time for my favorite part of the podcast, the most outrageous offer. And today it goes to an eBay seller. I'm not going to name the seller because I don't want to get banned. The last time I announced an eBay seller with an outrageous offer, they banned my account and I was unable to bid on any of their stuff. So we don't want to do that. But anyway, what I'm talking about is not exactly one of the books we discussed today, but a reprint of the very first hardcover, Doctor Who and the Auton Invasion, which was reprinted by W.H. Allen, and it's a first edition. It is not a dust cover, but it also um, includes the later illustration on the cover of the giant octopus uh, approaching the planet Earth with the neon Doctor Who logo. Um, that book is relatively easy to find versus the first uh, appearance of the book from Alan Wingate, as I discussed. And so um, the book in mint condition, non-library, which is pretty easy to find because those later editions were not um, made exclusively for libraries, but were made pretty well uh, for everyone. And when I was a dealer in the 80s, we carried this particular title and had plenty of copies. So I know that there's a bunch out there. But anyway, this seller is from Great Britain. And the buy it now price is the US equivalent to $247.64, which is a little above the mark. And um, I'm afraid to make an offer of what I th believe it's worth. It's worth about $150 US dollars in mint condition, an ex library copy around $75 to $95. I, I get into a lot of debates with people who are trying to gouge the American public who don't have access to these books, because many of these books were not, you know, I know for a fact that these books were not made available here in this country. Um, we, you know, as uh, when I was with Bundles from Britain, we were one of the first and only dealers to get access to those because no one else wanted them. The bookstop said no. The library said no. And so Lyle Stewart was looking for any way to get rid of these books because W.H. Allen didn't want them returned either. So we took advantage of that, and we became the only dealer at TARDIS 22 back in 1985 to have hardcover books. So anyway, if you uh, find an item out there that just gets you really upset that it's way out of line and way out of the price range, you can send us an email at Doctor Who Collectors podcast at gmail.com and send us the link to where you found this outrageous offer, and you might get it read on the air. That concludes this episode of the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast. I want to thank my friend Tony Witt, host and producer of the Doctor Who Target Book Club Podcast. You can find that podcast anywhere podcasts are found, but they mostly are on SoundCloud and iTunes, you know, Apple Podcasts and everywhere else you can find them. Uh, it's a wonderful discussion, and I really enjoy them thoroughly. If you're interested in the episodes I appeared on, I appeared on The Mind of Evil and Day of the Daleks. And so I thought it might be worthwhile to point out that Doctor Who and the Auton Invasion is also now a audiobook. And so we're going to close with a little clip from the audiobook of Doctor Who and the Auton Invasion. Until then, keep collecting. The Changing Face of Doctor Who. The cover illustration portrays the third Doctor Who, whose physical appearance was altered by the Time Lords when they banished him to the planet Earth in the 20th century. Doctor Who and the Auton Invasion by Terence Dix. Read by Caroline John. Chapter 1. Prologue. Exile to Earth.
In the High Court of the Time Lords, a trial was coming to its end. The accused, a renegade Time Lord known as the Doctor, had already been found guilty. Now it was time for the sentence. The Doctor looked very out of place, standing amongst the dignified Time Lords in their long white robes. To begin with, he was quite a small man. He wore an ancient black coat and a pair of check trousers. He had a gentle, rather comical face and a shock of untidy black hair. But there was strength in that face too and keen intelligence in the blue eyes. A hush fell as the president of the court rose and began to speak. Doctor, you have been found guilty of two serious offences against our laws. First, you stole a TARDIS and used it to roam through time and space as you pleased. Nonsense, said the doctor indignantly. I didn't steal it, just borrowed it for a while. The president ignored the interruption. More important, you have repeatedly broken our most important law. Interference in the affairs of other planets is a serious crime. Again the doctor interrupted. I not only admit my interference, I am proud of it. You just observe the evil in the galaxies. I fight against it. We have accepted your plea, Doctor, that there is evil in the universe which must be fought. You still have a part to play in that great struggle. At once the Doctor began to look hopeful. You mean you're going to let me go? Not entirely. We have noted your interest in the planet Earth. You have visited it many times. You must have special knowledge of that world and its problems. I suppose I have, agreed the doctor.